I also want um, to say that this apology is very inauthentic. Go on. Exactly. <laughs> um, and the card literally wrote, using a baby's head as an ashtray, the, the soft, bumpy spot. That's a Family Guy. Um, it's a scene from Family Guy. There you go. Have you seen it? It's a, it's a, yeah. Brit it's a Britney Spears yeah. cutaway where she's like <laughs> smoking and she doesn't have an ashtray. So she pokes the newborn's yeah. baby's head yeah. in and then puts the cigarette. So there you go. I'm safe. Welcome to the Sevo Show. We have Dave Hughes here. Not that Dave Hughes, the one from England. Uh, we go way back to a few years ago and uh, yeah, we're here now. Um, it's been overdue for a long time. Uh, we started out as friends, we're still friends, and Dave is a funny man, he's a writer, he's a stand-up comedian, he knows how to make shit funny without using AI, and if I could afford him, I wouldn't probably use AI ever, because legit, always good person. Anyway, Dave, thanks for coming in. Thanks for the intro. Missed you, Seb. You like that? I've you missed like that? you. I love missed you too. Um, and thank you for all the uh, advice you've given me over the years. In, uh, Likewise, and thank you for some of the stuff that I've just stolen from you. I think I told you about the tier system. I've been employing the tier system. Yes. Yeah, I love it. The For, I, for, for packages and, and... Yeah, anytime no. I do a joke package for any company, I'm like, here's your tier system. You've got tier one, two, and three. Tier one is that minimum, like this is the minimum amount of work I'll do for this amount of money. And then yep. tier three, I go all out, balls in. And what do you normally get? Which tier do they go for? Tier three. Yes. So many people oh. go for tier... My, I think I told you, my first one was Match.com when I used it with them. And I was like, I'm going to price this way out of the fucking... Because there's no way they'll go for it. And they were like, yeah, we'll take tier three. And I was like, you're fucking what? <laughs> I think that's when I texted you. I was like, <laughs> I was like, Seth, they, this is amazing. Yeah, it's fantastic. <laughs> it, so thank you for that. You're welcome. You're welcome. And uh, tier two, is it closer to tier three pricing or further away? No, it's further away. Further away. Yeah. But when, it's not much further away because I've yeah. seen examples of it where, like, I won't name any names, but I recently got a quote for something and uh, tier one was, let's just say, for example, it was like $100, right? Tier two was like $550 and tier three was like a grand. Okay. And I was like, there's very little middle ground here. Okay. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, that's not how I tried to do it. I think, I think if you bring tier two a little bit closer to tier three, tier three will look like a discount. Yeah, okay. It's like a, it's like at McDonald's, you have small, medium, large fries. This is where I got the idea from. Yeah. Um, the no one orders medium fries because it's a fifty cent upgrade to large. See, there you go. This way, this guy's the genius. <laughs> I just read a lot of <laughs> shit and I just regurgitate it because it. Well, I I read stuff, and I go, cool. Will that work for me? Yeah. And I try it. I'm like, oh, it worked for me. I have validated that I can now talk about it because I have the yeah. practical like uh, experience but i also saw it w like working in real time when i was working with you like i saw you do this stuff all the time so yeah. i was just like constantly making sometimes making notes and then sometimes just it was subconsciously like setting in yeah. and there were things that i was like i'd find myself going like oh what would Seth do yeah yeah <laughs> i i'm enjoying that a lot more now the sales um, yeah. because i believe in my products a lot more than i ever ever did um and because i directly talk to brands Mm. which gives you a whole bunch of leverage. Yeah. Um, no more middlemen. Yeah. That's my, that's my rule. Like agencies can get absolutely fucked. Yeah. Unless, unless they're, they're, they're like the top, top tier and they give me full creative reign and I can speak directly to the brand anyway. Mm. Like I've done with Denon last, last month. Okay. Amazing. Amazing yeah. experience. And this is like the thing that I'm moving into 2024 is not just um, getting people in with their experience, but moving forward and going, hey, if you want to be a full-time co uh, creator or com comedian, you need to be able to do the business side yeah. and the marketing side. And people don't want to – they don't think about that. They're like, I want to do this. Great. How are you going to monetize it? Hmm. Mm. I don't want to make reels. Well, how are people going to discover you? What is the CRM? Shit, you got to find out because yeah. when you start into packages, you got to figure it out. And I think that's the, that's the thing with a lot of uh, comics especially is yeah. that – they have like one toe kind of like dipped in yeah. and it's the doing the gigs part and yeah. then the rest of it just kind of falls by the wayside because either it's it's too much hard work or oh, everyone's doing it and mine's not really, do you know what I mean? Like yeah. there's, there's always... There's comparison as well. Yeah. The other thing as well is like, and this is something I, I told Delby and I'm so glad he went with it because it's worked for him uh, with his celebrant stuff because mm. he does the celebrant stuff. He was my celebrant and he was getting lots of bookings and i said to him what's your sales pipeline he's like what do you mean like, how, how many bookings do you have like a year in advance he goes oh heaps i'm like great double your rates he goes what no 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 celebrant would double their rates like that what where's the extra value i'm like who cares double your rates and see what happens in the next three months and then from what i remember 
Um, I'm, yeah, no, he, he called me up and he goes, Sev, I got two bookings. <laughs> Mm. Double the rates, which is literally used it's, to be four. It's more money, or yeah. it's the same. It can be the same amount of money for like half the work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And like, again, that was something that you told me. Uh, this would be like a year and a half, maybe two years ago, about the wedding photography, because yeah. that's what you were doing then. Yeah, that's where I got all my practice in, yeah. and now I'm trying to apply it as a personal creator. Yeah. And like, uh, I think I, we spoke about this ages ago, but you're if you're a content creator professionally it doesn't necessarily mean you're just an influencer. Influencers are content creators just for themselves. Yeah. They're not actual content creators as a whole. Yeah. When they content create for a restaurant, they're focusing on their own brand within it. Yeah. And what brands are failing to do is they're failing to go, we need someone to do that for us as first of mind. And agencies don't realize that. Mm. They just go, yep, give us a budget, 10 grand, great, cool. Influencer, what can you do for us? What's your what's your rates? Three hundred bucks, great, cool. Oh, a million views, awesome. Look at this, guys. Ten grand, a million views, and they're like, oh, sick, yeah, cool. That was worth it. The creator did all the work yeah. for three hundred bucks. Yeah. But if you get the brand to go straight to the creator and talk about it, the creator can charge three grand, do the same results, the brand gets a significant $7,000 discount and the creator's made 10 times more. Mm. Why do we have there's more communication man? between the two as well. Yeah, and why do we have a middleman? Because, what the fuck? What? I mean, again, I think we spoke about this, but I went back to London in like 2016, I think it was, and I, sp I met with an agent uh, in, in London who told me that if I wanted to write on panel shows in the UK, which was my goal at that point, and I hadn't done it at that point either, they said that I had to move back to England because I couldn't do it remotely. Again, dinosaurs who don't know about the internet. Um, <laughs> and that, uh, that, that it was really hard to break into that that into that industry, into that circle. Yeah. It's like, oh, you know, Jimmy Carr, everyone, they've all got their own writers. They're very hard to, to penetrate. And yeah, it's difficult, but it's not impossible. But they were doing that gatekeeping bullshit where they just wanted... They always want to make you feel that you can't do it without them. But you because really they can't. want the cut. Yeah. They want the cut. 10% mm. for doing fucking nothing. Yeah. <laughs> Minimum 10% yeah. as well. So how did you break through that yourself? Just determination and knowing that they were wrong. I was like, there is no fucking way that if I want to write one day a week on a panel or two days a week on a panel show that I need to be in a room with all these people. Like, I guarantee that's not the way it works. Yeah. And I was right. It wasn't. Yeah. Started talking to other comics that were on at the time. It was Mock the Week. That was the the first show that I broke into. Um, and uh, once I got one of them as well, it was just I just used that as leverage to get the rest of them. Yeah. So it, you only need the first one. Yeah, because as, as soon as you can go, hey, I've written four. Then suddenly, you know, everyone kind of like yeah. perks up and goes, oh well, he can do that job then. Yeah. Whether getting the first one's hard. I'll yeah. Give whether you that. it's for but comics or comics. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so your history growing up, you grew up in England. When when did you migrate to Australia? Uh, I came, so I left England in like 2008 and just travelled for about four years. Like Were you single then or were you? Yeah, no, I was single. Yeah. Um, travelled like a homeless person around the world for a while, ran out of money and then came here and I was like, oh, you can work here and get one of those work and holiday visas. And that must have been like 2000 and like 11 or 12. Literally one in two of every British person ever. You just, that's the summary. Yeah. yeah. Most of them don't do that traveling part in between though. They've seen Home and Away and Neighbours. <laughs> and they go, honestly, Seth, there is an, <laughs> the best show in the world called uh, Wanted Down Under. Yeah. Have you, have you ever heard of it? No. So it's a show about British families that <laughs> try to convince themselves that they need to move to Australia for a better life. And their frame of reference is always Home and Away and Neighbours. <laughs> they don't want to admit it, but that's the thing. And then they get here and they're like, what the fuck? This Midland, what? Are we... Oof. Never oh. heard of this place. This is a, where, where's the beach? <laughs> oh, it's incredible. And the best part about it is, is that they um they have a budget in mind of the house that they can buy. They'll be like, right, we've got a million uh, Australian to to buy this house, and they go shopping around. They get shown all these amazing houses, but they haven't had their house back in the UK evaluated yet. And they do they do it live on screen. They go, what's our house worth? And it turns out that little shithole in Manchester was actually worth like sixty thousand, <laughs> and they got nothing to play with. So then they're like, well, I guess we could grow our own vegetables. And oh, it's so funny. It, it's not meant to be. Yeah. It's it is fucking hilarious. And You've got to watch it. And then they all end up uh, North River up in Alchemos. Yeah, June the up and all yeah. that nonsense. Little yeah. Britain. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We've got uh, Chinatown in Northbridge and Little Britain up north. Yeah. And then the rest is just wogs and uh, the rest of them. Oh, that word. 
<laughs> that word, you guys use it so loosely. It, what it about does, palms? It doesn't, no, I mean the W word. It doesn't mean Italian where I'm from. I didn't say that. Wogs can mean anything. Oh, what, so what does it mean? Um, I don't know. I thought it meant Italians. I thought it meant in that region. Like Mediterranean. Yeah, going towards Lebanese as well. Oh, okay. Maybe. Yeah. I'm going to get sued. <laughs> so you, you moved here and how would you get your first kind of job here then? What were you doing? I was working on a farm. Yeah. No, 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 no. I was working here in Northbridge in a hostel for like... <sighs> Was I don't think I was getting much money at all. I had like an evening, like a night check-in thing that I would do, but I got a free room out of it. Yeah. And I was getting like maybe 20 bucks every time someone checked in. Yeah. And, uh, and at that point as well, I had like hardly any money left. Then mm. I got a job on the farm. And then, uh, then I decided I should do something proper. Yeah. Is that the British version of going out to the mines? Isn't fr I think fruit picking is the British version yeah. and the very low level version as well of going out yeah. to the mines. But uh, but with the the farm stuff, you've got to do agricultural work to extend your yeah. visa to a second year. So that was the other thing. I was like, I knew I wanted to stay here because as soon as I got here, I was like, oh, I love this place. Yeah, I yeah. love it here. And then where did you meet your wife? Now wife on that farm. On that farm. Yeah, and you picked her up. Picked her yeah. cherries. She Excellent. Was, uh, she was one of the attending vets to like all these yeah. horses and stuff that I was wanking off at the time. That's excellent, cool. yeah. excellent. So now that you're with her and she's wanking you off, um, where, and you have your kid, Oscar. Yeah. You also have your creative job. What's yeah. that like as a, as a family man? What's the stress like there? It's ideal. There is no, there's very little stress. It's been like this for a while now where... Let's go back before that because you still had to break through what was that like having a partner where you don't have a, a guaranteed salary every week? I think having, having a partner that believes in you is like, if you're gonna do it as, as a couple, you know, if you're in a, in a relationship and you don't have a, you have a partner who doesn't believe in you, you're fucked from, from the get go. And you'd know this too. Like, if, if they're not behind you, if they don't back you 100%, then yeah, forget about it. I, I could not have done this unless I was single. It, it probably would have been, if I'm being brutally honest, it probably would have been easier if I was single. But then at the same time, you've got somebody else. You're lonely as well, but you've got somebody else. Like if we're talking just financially, you've got somebody else with a guaranteed income while you're doing your thing that's like sometimes generating, you know, maybe a couple of grand a month and then suddenly fuck all for like two months. You're yeah. like, oh, we've still got to really work at this. That transition was, was difficult, but like, made so much easier by having a supportive partner. I love that. Yeah. I love that. And now you're here. You're, um, you're smashing it. When I first met you, you were doing the Trailer Park Boys stuff. Yeah. Tell me about that. So Trailer Park Boys came about, um, I was writing for Macaulay Culkin for like yeah. his website. Yeah. Uh, he has a website called Bunny Ears, which is just like a satirical, yeah. we just wrote like the stupidest articles. It was a lot of fun. But after a while he pulled funding on it, which yeah. was just an amicable thing. Like we just parted ways. And uh, about, I don't know, like maybe six months or so later, he just calls me and says he's got a great opportunity for me. Um, and it turned out to be that. It was the, the Trailer Park Boys because he's in with those guys, I guess. Um, and there was another company involved called Devil's Jew. Yeah. They were like the comic book side of it. Yeah. Macaulay actually thought that because I'd written for comics, as in comedians, he thought I'd written for comic books. So there was a bit of, uh, <laughs> bit of wires crossed there, but we worked that out. Um, I got the job and uh, yeah, it's been great. That's talent is talent and you know, you kind of, uh, yeah. you're, gonna get, you're, gonna get, you're gonna get work if you're talented and you work hard. Mm. So what, what seasons have you been writing? for Trailer Park Boys? So the last two, and then the last, I think we've got three, maybe four issues of the yeah. comic book. Yeah. yeah. So you, so the, the show itself, um, it's based in America. Yeah. How does that work living here? Well, Obviously the internet. Yeah. I'm aware of it. Oh, you mean like timelines and stuff like that? Yeah. And like the same with everything that I've done in other countries. It's always just like if you're if you're going to commit to this, then just understand that there's going to be some late nights and there's going to be some very unrealistic uh, deadlines. But what I tend to do is just make everything earlier than they need to be so that they suit my timeline a bit mm. better. So if somebody says, you know, all right, Wednesday, five o'clock is the deadline. And maybe to me, that's Tuesday 5 a.m. and or three o'clock in the morning or whatever. I'm like, all right, well, let's just bring it to like Monday. Let's just say if I get everything in by Monday, because that way there's room for them to come back with Revise. edits over the next couple of days. Yeah. And I would do it, especially with like joke packet stuff, where I knew that there was a budget. So if like, okay, I was writing for the dad at one point, 
and there was a certain budget for the whole writing staff. And I, I would think of it as like a f first come, first serve kind of deal sometimes. So I'd be like, well, they want minimum 10 and they want them by say Wednesday. So I'll give them like 25 and I'll give them to them on Monday. That way they see all my stuff first. So I may eat up more of the budget and then also just makes the editor's life a little bit easier because yeah. they go, well, we have what we need now for the week. Yeah. Which is probably a bit of a sly kind of approach, but I was like, fuck it. Like I needed to make money and this was the, the it seemed to serve as well. Like it seemed to work for me. So yeah. Yeah, I did I, it with you. Like I tried to make sure everything was like in earlier with you as well that way. Yeah, it worked really well. Cause you could always be like, hey, can we change this, this and this? And yeah. I'm like, all right, well, I still got like a couple of days before you wanted them anyway. So of course. Yeah, that, and that, <laughs> that was brilliant. So for everybody that doesn't know, Dave was helping me um, at the time of Red Rooster when I was uh, monitoring or managing their uh, TikTok account. And um, the story Some behind that... Someone say killing their TikTok. You were killing it on their TikTok. <laughs> well, you were killing it on their TikTok. You're still pinned. I know, but... You're they... still pinned at the top of Red Rooster's <laughs> TikTok. The first two, first videos, two videos you see yeah. is you. You sent me a screenshot of that the other day. You were like, how long has it been? And we're still like the... What did you say? That we, we still had the most views? We have the most organic video, yeah. viral video of any um, fast food place in Australia. Nice. No ad spend. Nice crushed it we did we did those were fun videos too yeah because again that was when they were sort of okay with us leaning into the conspiracy stuff of them not having <laughs> any customers that was fun that was so they were they <coughs> they me. didn't originally want to go with it because they no, thought I remember, they and then you pressed it a bit and then, and then <laughs> once they went with it it was like all right we have free range to just have so and much fun with that's this. when the magic happened mm. that's when they grew and i remember going on and being uh just making comments on their channel well this is what i was going to say that's where you were killing it the that's most that community engagement stuff that you were doing yeah. like i saw wendy's <laughs> twitter yeah and that was my inspiration yeah i was like i don't think i could be as edgy as them but i'm gonna see if i how far i can take yeah. it you know and i learned a lot about um the pr side of things like stella shout out to stella if you're listening she 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 taught me a lot about <laughs> all the all the shit and uh, oh the that hoops. that lady that lady's amazing yeah but um yeah I remember one specific one that had a hundred thousand likes one comment I made really hundred k hundred k likes on oh, a shit, comment even I didn't know what do you remember the comment yeah 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 what was it so it was twenty twenty two December and Australia just knocked off Denmark in the FIFA World Cup yeah and uh, this was like at night time so I was sleeping. I woke up at 5 a.m. and I saw these all these TikToks of Melbourne streets at 3 a.m. Flares going off and the crowds just like they're rioting, but it's all good. There's no violence yeah. or anything. Everyone's just stoked. Just happy. Yeah. And I just logged into a Red Rooster straight away and goes, "Man, this feels like 10 a.m. when we open our doors every morning." Nice. <laughs> and it just <laughs> half the comments were like. Uh, what? So you did that on a on a like a news video? A yeah, report. yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. And oh, I did it. I did it in multiple. I just went ham, and I because yeah. the algorithm by then on, on Red Rooster was a lot of FIFA World Cup stuff. Yeah. So I just kept peppering any Australian content because I knew that Australians would be looking at that yeah. content. And then and then and I had so many different videos with the same comment, just like, like why is Red Rooster here? What what is this a le legit Red Rooster? Uh, and then my favourite comments, the ones I screenshotted and put it in my portfolio, was this comment made me laugh so hard. I'm getting Red Rooster tonight. That's th there's no better outcome. There is no better outcome, and there was there was multiple. Like I was screenshotting over and over. I got I got like um, tendonitis. <laughs> I got carpal tunnel screenshotting so much tendonitis. <laughs> yeah, but uh, that was that was the most fun. And then yeah, it all finished up because. I'm, I won't go into it, but just politics. Yeah. Just not between us. Silly politics. Yeah. Not between me and you. No, not between us. No. No, we were crushing it. No, I was just telling the viewers that. Yeah, no, yeah, it wasn't yeah, between yeah. me and <laughs> yeah. Everything is um, good. No, no. With, with, with uh, I mean, I'm, I don't really sh give a shit about fast food now. I haven't had Red Rooster or KFC. I haven't had Red Rooster since we yeah. last had Red Rooster yeah. when we were in there filming. Yeah. The chicken's great. It is, but it's it not is. something like, oh, actually, this is a terrible ad now, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Red Rooster, the chicken's fantastic, but I haven't eaten it in about a year and a half. Yes, yeah. But, like, the, the whole seed oil thing, I won't go into it um, too much. Uh, just, yeah, it just scares me. Yeah. See, anything cooked in seed oils, canola oil, 
uh, vegetable oil, any of those oils. Is KFC yep. cooked in it? Yep, shit. No, I don't need any, it. Any fried food. Any fried food. Uh, grill, grilled. Grilled has a fryer mm. that is olive oil only, and that's expensive. Yeah. It's not cheap. That's why they use canola oil. And now I'm getting into it. Um, but they have these chicken bites, right? And then you deep fry them in the olive oil. No seed oil. It's a lot healthier than the canola stuff. Oh, that's good to know. A lot, a lot healthier. Grilled is delicious too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there you go. There's an ad. You can hire us next, Grilled. We'll run your socials up better than anyone else ever will. You will have the second most viewed <laughs> organic <laughs> viral content. <laughs> well, like I, I use a lot of... Uh, I. The secret to social media success is to test at the start, get the engagement from the audience, and then double down on what they're saying. That's it. Mm. That is it. And to to be able to do that, you need to be present. You need to show up. Mm. Like, I need feedback for what they're saying. Okay. Once you have feedback, you have a point of reference, and you can go from there. Right? Yeah. It's, like, it's like when you're on stage as a stand-up comedian. If you get a reaction from the crowd better one night than opposed to another night, what does that mean? The crowd's a bit different. Do you pivot? Do you change it up a little bit? Do you start going to the the old time stuff, or do you just keep going and see what happens? With with so online stuff, I go right. What are they reacting to the most? Can I trigger them further without getting cancelled, <laughs> mm-hmm. or uh, do I just change it completely and try again? You know? Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because I apply that technique to everything as well, um, it, including, you know, writing on certain shows where mm. you have to find, like, one person's voice. Mm. So you'd be writing for, like, one particular host or whatever, and then I will just look at things over time, uh, what the type of things that work the most. Like, right, if I, if I get this person talking about, like, their family or mm. about brands or about food or, like, what is the thing that typically seems to make it to the desk, like, to, on the final joke sheet? Yeah. And are they getting good reactions when they're filmed as well? Because yeah. there'll be some things that you might write and think that you've got it in that person's voice, but you're like, eh, they don't really like it when he talks about that or when he kind of like, you know, if he's, if he's down on himself or whatever, some people don't really like it. Yeah. So just, yeah, doing that. Again, doing the Sev trend thing, just watching for trends. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and yeah, how, how good you feel saying it. There's a lot of analytics behind it. There's a lot of reflection. There's a lot of mm. going back and, and, and tinkering. And this is what creators don't do. Like, I've been a bit lazy with it over the last year. I've got my evergreen stuff that works, any any interviews, and then any little things that I can do at the start. Like, one video, I was interviewing a bunch of Kiwi kids that were on holiday uh, in Perth. And uh, where are you from was the first question I asked. It's obvious they're from New Zealand. Good, their accents were quite strong. And when they said New Zealand, and this is a big shout-out to Kale, the editor that I have, he purposely put in a map of Italy instead of New Zealand. Mm-hmm. And ha- like there's about a 1,000 comments saying... Always be like, is that? Uh, do you guys know? <laughs> yeah. Like, but you can't do that all the time. No. It's a special moment. But if you build up a repertoire of these little things... Yeah, just to fire people up the oh right way. Oh, man. And, and that takes experience. Yeah. You know, yeah. And now I'm trying to go into this educational space with my channel, mm. where it's still funny, but there's an underlying message. It's not just a bunch of um, gibberish. You know, like shout out to all those you know trios. It's, it's a it's a trend in Australia. There's the there's it's it's always three dudes. Yeah. It's inspired, unemployed. Um, the one here in Perth, um, kick it forward with. Um, I'm not aware of them. Uh, and there's a few others. Uh, Swag on the beat, I think it's called. Mm. Yeah, it's just three dudes, three dudes, three dudes, three dudes, and then they like bounce off each other. Yeah, and it's really good because three the trios. What was the first one called? Uh, kick, kick it forward, okay. kicking it forward, kick yeah. it forward. Yeah, um, and uh, and I'm just like fuck. Do I need do I need something like that, or can I continue doing a solo thing? Because it gets it mm. gets a bit. It gets a bit boring doing it by yourself or not, not boring but lonely. And then you have like Jamal coming up the rear and then you when I can finally afford you again. Um, I think the key is to keep the solo thing always going. Of but course. to have other stuff going as well. Of course. Like there's nothing wrong yeah. with, you know, doing a little, yeah, yeah like a, a three-man thing. I mean, Mr. Beast succeeded because he had the luxury of, you know, chilling and staying, living, and re- living at home mm. for as long as possible. And he had his mates that went all in with him 
and said, even though he was the mascot essentially even, for that whole even, thing. Yeah, yeah, he was the he was the front man. Yeah, and you need a good front man for a band to succeed. For anything. For anything, yeah. you need a leader, but that leader shouldn't have ego. They should take care of their their team members. Yeah, because then what's the point? And if they decide to go solos, like I don't need you guys anymore, then well, fucking whatever. Mm. You know, you could die of AIDS eventually if that <laughs> happens. I'm going to get fucking destroyed for that one when someone finds out what I mean. <sighs> I don't know what you mean. Freddie Mercury? Oh. No? I'm just leaving that alone. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I can own that because I look like him. Oh, okay. I won't go solo though. And I won't die of AIDS. The solo thing. Okay, there we go. It was the solo thing. Yeah. Right. <laughs> You're a terrible human being. I love Queen. <laughs> I love Queen. I love Freddie. I love all the guys. It's, it's a joke. Queen is uh, one of those bands that like I'm really aware of, and I have listened. I've heard like probably mm. every song. I don't mm. own a single Queen song. Like I don't have a single Queen song on my phone. Or never have. Not really yeah. my. Can you sing the entire Bohemian Rhapsody though? Definitely not. Really? Not even like a line of it. Wow. Yeah. You are definitely fake weird. British. Yeah, yeah weird. Yeah. But like. And, and I, I want to segue this uh, to joking about that sort of thing. I don't actually mean all of what I just said. Yeah, it's of course. Just, it's just my, my humor. It's yeah. dark, it's fucked, and I want to explore that more and bring it out and not be afraid of someone clipping that one day going, oh, look at him. He's fucking... Yeah, but I mean, it kind of doesn't... It's getting to a point now, I think, where it doesn't really matter too much. Yeah. So, like, you... You know, oh, so right. maybe someone does clip that and um, uh, that will only serve you better in the future. Yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Like there might be a little bit of pushback, but it's usually just a tiny bit yeah. of pushback that everyone magnifies. Yeah. Everyone else doesn't really give a shit. And then at the same time, you're being thrust into the spotlight a little <laughs> exactly, bit more than you were. Exactly. Good PR, uh, any PR yeah. is good PR. So, all right, we'll segue two ways because this kind of goes back down to the cancel culture part. So Ricky Gervais... You're like the Aussie version of him. Um, Armageddon. Armageddon, right. I watched it the other day yeah. and I liked it. Okay. I, I had a good sniffle. Yeah. It wasn't as good as the last one he did. I think it's his weakest. Supernatural. I think it's his weakest by far. Yeah. Um, and I feel that he's covering a topic every other comedian's doing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the whole fucking woke shit. And a He's lot not of doing anything particularly like interesting with no, it either. That's the real. It's problem. been done before, but yeah. but I feel like all the comics, and I feel like this is almost every space of online content. Something's happening. Everyone jumps on it to put their own perspective on it mm. as a fear of missing out because their fans go, "Hey, Ricky, we want to know your thoughts about work. Come on, come on, come on. Yeah. Give us a give us a shout." And yeah, he he nailed it a little bit. My favorite part was when he said that he, he promised his wife he wouldn't do the accent. And then the second one he did, <laughs> the little little kid in the wheelchair, six year old, and <laughs> how he talks about this was really funny. He goes, y "You synthesize for him, but he's a racist." Now, what do you think? And he really put like a a different spin on it, and I really like that. Okay, yeah. now he's a racist and he's also sexist, yeah, or something like that. Yeah. And I'm just like, yeah, I actually, yeah, fuck that, fuck that six year old kid, racist. <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> I don't know, look, part of, yeah, part of, I'm not saying it wasn't funny and I didn't enjoy yeah, it at yeah, all. Yeah. I just, for the most part, I thought it was quite, um, it's quite ironic that he felt the need to complain for like an hour about yeah. people who complain. Yeah, like yeah, that yeah. was crazy to me. Yeah. I was like, as no one, did you not think about this a little bit? Because that's all you're doing. You're just, you're just complaining about the people that you yeah. claim you don't really like. Yeah. Dave Chappelle did a, a whole, uh, like a better one. Did you see the latest yeah, one? Yeah, I watched that as well. I watched it yesterday or the day before. Again, it wasn't really like, uh, but here's the thing. I don't think what Chappelle does now is necessarily comedy. It's more just a, it's like a TED talk. It's social commentary. It's it's still fantastic. He's still. He's a great storyteller. He's, he's incredible. Mm. He, he could probably just tell a joke for like 20 minutes, not really need a punchline and we'll still just listen yeah. and be like, fuck, yeah, it's Dave Chappelle. Yeah. But he, you yeah. Know, he's earned that. Of course yeah. he has. Um, I don't know. I just d genuinely, I'm not saying this because I'm worried about anything coming back on me. Genuinely, these topics don't interest me or excite me in the slightest. Mm. The trans conversation and all that sort of mm. thing it doesn't it doesn't interest me what tickles your fancy in that comedy space like how do you how I do love, i get you i love silly stuff yeah at the moment like to me the the best two specials i've seen in a long time now are, they're both shane gillis's 
Yeah, oh, Shane. Live in Austin was the Shane's best thing I've, I've ever seen. <laughs> and then Beautiful Dogs is probably as good, if not Live in Austin might be a little bit better. Yeah. But they are both absolutely fucking flawless. Yeah. They're phenomenally funny. Yeah. And even he takes something that I'm not interested in, which is the like politics and Donald Trump and stuff like that and the Fox News <laughs> stuff. So he took two things that I'm really not that bothered about and he made them so fucking funny that I had to be interested in them, what he was saying at least. Oh, his, his, his voice, tr Donald Trump voice is It's so amazing. Good. The cadence of it is fantastic, but just... <laughs> Oh, the what is it? Um, when he when he's doing the um, he died like a dog. When he does that whole bit, I can't watch that without having to pause it. Like every, I'm like, dude, you've seen this like eight times now, and you can't watch it without cry laughing. <laughs> it's about the part is like, what if what if he gets shot one day? He'll be like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was it? The uh, Biden being punch assassinated. <laughs> oh Fucking God. phenomenal stuff. I, it's stuff I've I've never heard of before, but it's so true. You're like, that's that's a very interesting take on it. Yeah, and even the even the downs stuff, which I don't really find humorous at all, but the way he the down stuff, which I don't really find humorous at all, the way he talks about it is like it's it's really endearing for yeah. one thing. Yeah, but then it's also very very funny. Yeah, <laughs> you know, a lot of you may think I I have Down syndrome, but I, I, what did he say? He's like, I weaved it. I managed he goes, to... I dodged that bullet, but it nicked me. It nicked me. <laughs> and then when he talks about going to the uh, Washington uh, Memorial tour thing, and there's like... That's fantastic. Do you know what's amazing? Oh, my God. You know what's amazing about that is I watched that special before Andrew Wolf watched it, and Wolfie yeah. opened for Shane when he was here. Wow. Yeah. And uh, I was talking to Wolfie about it. I said, like, have you seen the special? And he goes, no, I haven't watched it yet. And then Wolfie said, does he do the, the George Washington bit? Because he was, he was trying it here and it wasn't working. Like he just couldn't, oh, get, really? it, couldn't get it to work. Or, you know, it was obviously in, pro, in progress. Yeah, and he yeah, was yeah. like trying to perfect it. And I was like, yeah. And he goes, does it work? I was like, does it? It kills. It's <laughs> so fucking funny. That's amazing. It would be great. I would love to have been, it, maybe just even at the show to see it not work. Yeah. To then watch it. On, on the special and yeah, see Yeah, how they how how he crafts it, and I think like because you've been trying to get me to do stand up forever now, and, and me just learning about that's part of the process. Yeah, it not working is part of the process, and that's what they do. That's what it's they a go painful out. part of the process. But yeah, it's an ancient part of the process. painful painful yeah painful I mean, part of the process. You know? And then you get you get those mannerisms, and you get those you, you get that technique or that template or that format, and you mm. go. This, that, in the middle, done, test. Mm, where do you reckon I lost them? Probably there. Da, 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 da. Mm. Me doing that live and analyzing it, I don't know I'm ready yet. Cause but if you don't analyze it like in the moment. You have to be committed to you it watch in the, the moment. Tapes. And then you, or just think about it like on the drive home. It's like, why, yeah. didn't, why didn't that work? Yeah. Why did sometimes I get a it's just like one it. word. Yeah. Or the way you said that one word. Yeah. So now going into the cancel culture bit. In my, in my th view, I reckon we're going full circle. Cancel, yeah. cancel culture itself is getting cancelled. Well, it, yeah, and it, it almost, I think, you know, it's kind of pointless. People like uh, Gervais, for example, um, if he even complains about cancel culture in the slightest because he's been cancelled numerous times now and it's had no negative impact mm. on him whatsoever. So, yeah. like, what are you talking about now? Yeah. Because no one, really, no one cares, I'm convinced. I'm yeah. convinced no one gives a fuck. Yeah. There's a small minority and that voice is quite loud. Mm. And by that, I mean a small major a small number of people. That voice is quite loud, but it's only loud on fucking Twitter. And you can, you can discover a lot of dark shit about someone's sense of humor, depending mm. on how you, you know, where you're at with them, whether it's in person, publicly or privately. Yeah. And my, one of my favorite ways to uh, discover where someone's line is, is playing Cards Against Humanity. Yeah, and uh, I did. I yours truly. That. Yeah. So how did how did you get that gig? I believe that gig came through McCall writing Culkin? for the dad. Oh yeah. No, no. Um, <laughs> this is the thing. Like, and as you know as well, like one job invariably leads to another because yeah. you work for someone, and they go like, "Oh, he's pretty good. Like, yeah. I think he'll be really good for this other role that's just popped up." Because you know they all talk to each other too. It's like, hey, we're running a thing next week or whatever. Did you know anyone? Yeah. No. So how do you sit there and go, right? Cards against humanity. What do you do? So they gave us um, they gave us a bunch of like examples 
And once you get the formula, it's kind of like writing for another comic or whatever. Like once you have their voice, their, the formula of their voice, once you have the formula for Cards of Humanity and you write, you, you start thinking in that voice, it's so easy. It's harder to stop than it is to keep going. Yeah. There's some fucked up combinations of cards I've played over my time. Well, that's the beauty of it. The beauty of it is they need to be fucked up in a combination and together and, uh, uh, separately they have to be innocuous. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, do you have any cards that you remember that you wrote that you were like, that's fucked? No, but because <laughs> I've never played the game. Okay. But my sister was playing it on, I think, Christmas Eve or something. And uh, I was like, I want, does she know that I wrote for that? And I was like, <laughs> probably not. And so I told her. Um, and she was like, oh, so this is all your fault then. And I was like, well, I can't remember what I did. So I looked up the email that I sent off with my thingy. I'll send it to you later. We'll, you'll see the examples. But um, I can't remember a single one of them. I, when, when you told me that and I played it after, mm. I think it might be a placebo, but I just looked at all of the cards. I was like, Dave wrote this. Dave wrote this. Dave <laughs> definitely wrote this one. You well, know? you know my voice very well. Yeah. So I think that might be part yeah. of it. You can at least imagine me. So, yeah. And you know what, this would be one of the reasons why I got it in the first place is yeah. because somebody else went, I can see him doing this. Mm. I, I have, um, uh, I like the ones where you can write your own shit because yeah. they give those out in packs as well. Oh, okay. And uh, <laughs> I was like, right. And I went on Reddit because I, I wasn't creative at, in the moment and I just really wanted to write something. And the most fucked up one I saw that I wrote immediately, and forgive me for everybody who thinks this is also fucked up, but it's Cards Against Humanity. It's against humanity, literally. I also want um, to say that this apology is very inauthentic. Go on. Exactly. <laughs> um, and the card literally wrote, using a baby's head as an ashtray, the, the soft, bumpy spot. That's a Family Guy. Um, it's a scene from Family Guy. There you go. Have you seen it? It's a, it's, a Brit, yeah. it's a Britney Spears yeah. cutaway where she's like smoking and she doesn't have an ashtray. So she pokes the newborn's yeah. baby's head in yeah. and then puts the cigarette. So there you go. I'm safe. Um, yeah. Family Guy did it first. Yeah. Seth, that's Simpsons. your fault. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, on the spot, if you can, yeah. using that tone of voice and that example, come up with another one for Cards Against Humanity. So I can't even remember what the format of the game is. No, no, no what, using my on. example. <laughs> Okay, here we go. He's going to bring I'll, it up. Because I'll, 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 uh, I remember sending them to my sister, so it'll be in my <laughs> recent messages. Right. Sorry to get my phone out. No, that's okay. This is a perfect time to show you this. Sorry for the interruption, but this show would not be possible without the help of Bright Tank Brewery. They are the major sponsor of the Sevo Show. Huge shout-outs to them. Check them out. Great beers, great people, great everything. And, uh, well, let's get back to the episode. So Dave's got the Cards Against Humanity screenshot out and these are the ones that went live. Believe they were the ones that they, they took on the package, yeah. Okay, so white card. Can I read these out? Yeah, yeah, go for it. White card number five, drinking piss. Nice. <laughs> How'd you come up with that? <laughs> Probably felt like drinking piss. <laughs> <laughs> drinking piss or urine? Well, this is the thing. You guys say alcohol as you say well, drinking piss. Yeah. And we, we don't say that anywhere else in the world that I'm aware of. So that, that was just <laughs> that was just fun for me. So you go to America, guys. Let's go drink yeah, some yeah, yeah. piss. Well, because when I when I got here what? and you're like, oh yeah, we're, we're we're drinking piss. I'm like, that is fucking disgusting. What are you talking about? <laughs> Dude, that's a good skit. <laughs> Number six, kicking immigrants. Yeah, keep going. <laughs> and I could see the card that I would add into that. Donald Trump kicking yeah, immigrants. Exactly. I think there's a Trump or a Biden or yeah, something yeah. in there. Number seven, a sea container full of teeth. No idea, just random, random shit. That's random shit. All right, number eight, thinking about lighthouses. I could see how that can... I think I just watched The Lighthouse, <laughs> which quickly became like my favourite film ever. Have you seen it? No. Has it oh. got a sea container full of teeth? No, but it may as well. Yeah. It's so fucking <laughs> surreal. Um, interrogating pigeons. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I, I like I like Cards Against Humanity because I have a sense of humor that in my head I can make any of those cards funny in yeah. my head. Yeah. But when I try to play those cards and it doesn't land with anyone, I'm like, great, this is what comics feel like when they're when you're trying, trying something, something yeah, new. Yeah. Um, number 10, being the Pope. Number 11, necrophilia. Just, just, that's <laughs> just it necrophilia. by itself. Number 12, defecating on baby Jesus, on the baby Jesus. Yeah, give him his the. What you, come on. What's your favorite holiday holiday 
Defi- uh, past time, defecating on the baby Jesus. Uh, <laughs> paper, fucking hell. And I'm looking at the, I'm thinking about the black cards that, that would be used. Um, well, they, aren't they on there too? Uh, yeah, these are all yeah. white cards still. Uh, doing impressive handstands. Pretty impressive handstands. Um, choosing shit haircuts. So you can merge those two together. Uh, clapping at the wrong part of the uology. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's hilarious. Um, uh, okay, black card number one. Rich, me- uh, rich white men are. Yeah, so clapping at the wrong part or yeah. defecating on the baby Jesus. <laughs> uh, number two, Elon Musk has allegedly stopped blank as it interferes with his work. <laughs> Necrophilia. There you go. <laughs> uh, black card number three. In space, nobody can hear you defecating on the baby Jesus. Fair enough. Or kicking him. Immig- <laughs> This, you just play the game with just this set. That's that, yeah, that was the, the Dave Hughes starter pack. That was the point. Yeah. Number four, White House staffers. Staff, staffers? We say staffers. <laughs> staffers. White House staffers. I was thinking about staffies. <laughs> White House staffers are now kick Im- kicking immigrants. There you go. Uh, and number five, Buzz Aldrin recently admitted to. Kicking pigeons, who knows? Yeah, being the pope. Interrogating pigeons. Being the pope. It? Being the pope. Or yeah. drinking piss. Whilst being the Pope. There you go. <laughs> I always liked the card, the black cards with just one line. I, I didn't like the double ones. Yeah. Because it was just too hard. And like the way that the, the, the game works, it has like, you know, um, you get 10 cards or whatever. And you have that shit card you're trying to get rid of. And then you bury it to get another one or however you play with the rules. You haven't played it. You wouldn't know. No. And um, yeah, you pick up another white card and you're like, Okay, cool. And then the next person that reads their black card, they're like, fuck, I just buried a good one yeah. for that. It would have worked for that. So, But all in all, it's and, – and then it becomes a tactic of trying to guess who, who card because the, the aim of the game is black cards played by – you all take turns. Yeah. And, um, and then each person plays their white card and then they shuffle them into the, the, the deck. They'll put them in the middle and then the person with the black card picks them all up shuffled and then reads them out in order and then they have to whichever one they found the funniest combination that person who, who uh, had that white card gets the black card and the black card is the score right okay and it gets to a point where it becomes a little bit competitive where you're like that was really funny but this motherfucker definitely said that so i don't want him to win because he's got all the black cards uh, okay <laughs> so it gets a bit interesting yeah. um but um so you talked about how you landed your job in that. You got your trailer bark boys. You, you're crushing it there. How about your comedy scene? Your to- your comic. You, That's the you, thing you, I'm enjoying the most. Yeah. Yeah. Because so I'm always learning. Like I'm still how, how brand it, new. How does it feel having your safety net as the writing part mm. of the process for other people? But then obviously you're writing for yourself as well. Because I'm in the same boat where I'm writing shit for myself for my content. Yeah. Online. We'll get to that in a bit. But then also I'm getting hired to help others. Yeah. And my safety net is essentially the same thing. Mm. I, I make the money. My income is from teaching or helping other brands or people. Whilst I build my own personal brand up, which according to a lot of the really successful influencers out there or content creators, like Mr. Beast, seventh year, that's when he really started to exponential. Mm. And I'm in my... F- fifth year probably semi-professionally professionally and i'm like right i need to keep going but i also need to make money on the side to fund that dream yeah similar to you then yeah i mean i i think of stand-up as an extension of what i do i think that's probably yeah. the, the best way to to think of it for me but it was more you know the the, the hardest part was just putting myself out there because I'd like, you know, like you, I'd always been able to put my stuff out there with somebody else's face on it. So if it didn't work, I'm like, that's not my fault. Do you know what I mean? (laughs) You paid for it. It's your problem now. (laughs) You make it funny. You agreed it was funny when I wrote it. You go make it funny. Yeah. But now it's like I write it and then I I do that to myself. The whole process Now go and make it funny. So, and if it's not funny, it's a hundred percent your fault. Do you have any specific goals you'd like to hit in that realm? A lot. Yeah. Um, so my goal for last year was just to do comedy somewhere else. I just wanted to go and 
perform anywhere else. So I went down to, to Mandra. Yeah, I went to Brisbane and <laughs> did, a, did a run in Brisbane. Um, I'll do Melbourne after this fringe. Yeah. Um, just to be like more active like elsewhere. Just yeah. to, yeah, and part of it's networking as well, obviously, which is a bit, yeah. But, <laughs> well, you got to. Yeah, um, yeah, you got to. Everyone's got to see you, you doing it. And you got to. So you, you, you went to Brisbane. Do, is that all like expenses paid and everything? Um, no, no, I, I, I paid for my flights, but I got paid for like all the gigs that I did when I was there. Cool. So it kind of like balances out. Three tier so. package, five, 10, 15 minutes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that, that, that's not a bad, not a bad plan for maybe five years down the line. <laughs> um, no, bookers just dictate exactly what you're doing. You say, yeah. Hey, can I do, although some of them, it was crazy because there were some places that I reached out to and I think it helps when you know you're a fairly regular at like the comedy lounge and places like that and they just i think they just assume that you're a headliner and shit because people are like yeah you can have this night for your solo show and i was like well, well, well i don't have a solo show so calm down like i don't have only a five minutes yeah still. like i just need a yeah. 15 10 15 minute spot that's where we're at right now yeah how many um, times have you had a moment where <laughs> they thought you were the other dave hughes and then you rock up you're like what no. the fuck is this shit no, I always make it very... But, I mean, again, it's only been Brisbane where I've done it elsewhere. So that's the yeah. only time there would have been any I confusion. Wait. But I can't wait for the story of when that happens the first time. Yeah, I that's hope. not going to happen. I'm way too careful. I'm way too careful can you, with that Can stuff. you just let one slip just, just for a dance? No, just, be, it would be <laughs> the worst. Can you imagine? Yeah, that's what I love. <laughs> Well, it would be the worst for me. I would, or, I would feel so bad. Or like so do a bad. double, do a double where where you you start getting headline shows and then you call up Dave and go, hey, can you come in and, and open for me? And then or, confuse or, 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 or out or of close for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I reckon you should try that. Okay. Here's the thing: he's like I've heard, I haven't seen him perform. Yeah, but apparently he's had like this next wave of just he's crushing it again. Yeah, not that he ever like fell off. I'm sure he's always yeah. been this great comic or whatever. I I, I don't know. Mm. But I've heard that he like he has not sort of even remotely, you know, kind of fizzled out. Like now he's on this new wave of just killing everywhere, which yeah. I think is fucking amazing. Well, he was on the Channel 10 7 p.m. project, wasn't he? Yeah, but I never wrote for him. You there was a little him? crossover. Tell, tell me about that. Just uh, just about just the project. Yeah, the project. You you got that well, like over a year ago now. I'm a two yeah, it's year. about a year and a half, I think. Yeah. yeah. So. And and that that was cool. I was I was stoked for you. Yeah, because we, we well, I think we'd finished up working together as well at that point. Yeah. 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 For now. Poor, we're, For now. We're, we're on we hiatus. Yeah. We're on hiatus. Yes. We're on hiatus. This man's not cheap, but he's worth it. <laughs> and he's got tears now. So I'm, I've got tears thinking about paying him. <laughs> yeah, I, I I can come to you with your own tear tear system next. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I, I, I've I've got it sussed for my next kind of plan going forward with it. Um, I the re recurring revenue is everything, mm. and that means that everything's systemized and and I can go cool. Dave, are you available for two hours a week? Great, let's fucking do weird shit. Mm. And then, oh, best feeling is when that hits. Yeah, you know, on social media because it's different on social media than it is on stand up. And again, also um, on television. Do you feel like TV's sort of on its way out? I'm amazed it's not gone completely already, to be honest with you. But I mean, obviously, I'm happy that a lot of the work that I do is on TV and where I still get to do that work. Mm. But I don't kind of count on it yeah. in that way because I'm just like, well, yeah, I'm always amazed that especially free to air stuff is still a thing and that there's as much money in it as there is. To well, I think it's the older generations that are really is, watching. Yeah, yeah. So I don't see. But then that said, yeah. the social media as well of well, shows like The Project. That's how you like we have an enormous social media following yeah. across all platforms. That's how, that's how you got to pivot. You got yeah. to expand that way. And that's that's really it. The, the, the free to air stuff is like, yeah. Or give the boomers and the Gen Xs what they want. Yeah, but then yeah. it goes on the template website where most people probably watch it. If we're being mm -hmm. honest, the ratings for yeah. like the actual live and you showing. get a lot, you get a lot of better stats for your demographic yeah. as well, so you can pivot. Hundred percent, and then yeah, across uh, TikTok, YouTube, yeah. Facebook, Instagram, um, the views on like just uh, as you know, like one yeah. piece of content that you've just repurposed for all of those platforms. Yeah can go viral everywhere and I'm still, you know it, you've made your money back. I'm still keen on pitching a uh, a tall idiot abroad sort of thing. Yeah. That would be fucking brilliant. Yeah. I'm going to Japan soon. Oh, yeah? Yeah, 20th. Nice. I'll be in Tokyo for a day and then I'm going snowboarding in Niseko. Oh, nice. With Sabine, which is going to be fun. But that first day in Tokyo, um, I've never been to actual Tokyo before, so I'm going to just 
em- embrace it. Yeah. It's going to be winter as well, so it's going to be a bit how I up. But You're going to film stuff? And yeah. yeah. But I'd, I I just want to enjoy it with Sabine. Yeah. Because I, I like, have this rule, like, I anytime I go somewhere for the first time, I don't want to be that Sev, yeah, Sevo show, enough. Sev's picks, red mic, interview shit. Yeah. I want to go... I, I just get too distracted. I'll be, like, interviewing someone, I'm like, what the fuck? Yeah. There's Onsen right there. I'm ready. Yeah. You know? But, um... Later on down the track, I really like. I I was always pissing myself about that show on mm. SBS. That the Qantas idea that you had was it Qantas or Qantas? What, yeah, you wanted to pitch something to Qantas a while back where they kind of like funded trips around Australia. Oh man, for you to do ex- essentially that. I, I I'd have to start locally and yeah. then I'd have, and then I'd expand to nationally and then internationally. That's how you work it. Mm. But um, yeah, it's. It's leveraging my height, but then also my curiosity, my Sev's point of view with people, but also experiences and places. Yeah. I don't want to do reviews. I want to do uh, point of views, this yeah. is my, which is technically the same thing. I think it would be funny to go to really exotic places and review things that you can get anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I like going up to people who are mid-meal at lunch. And so go, you're the worst human being yes, alive. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, just yeah. go And just go, hey, can you just quickly review this? <laughs> I did it at the Royal While Show. While they're chewing. Yeah, yeah, I did it at the Royal Show. It worked. Really? Yeah, it worked. I mean, I love you, so that's fine. But yeah. if some random person came up to me while I'm eating and said, like, hey, can I? I'd be like, I will eat that fucking microphone and then your face, <laughs> you know, get out of my... Oh. You have to, you have to like really know, like if, if it's, it's, it's it, getting a read on people really yeah, quickly. It's yeah, it's helpful yeah. when someone looks at me like you can see in their eyes they recognise me. Yeah, and then they're like mid mouthful, and you're like review. Do you know on the recognising you thing? Something that I talk to people about whenever it comes up because I was, I always knew that obviously when I when we started working together, I think you had about six or seven hundred thousand or something yeah. on on TikTok. Um, so I knew you had like a huge following. I got like I wasn't surprised by it. But I didn't think that translated into real life necessarily, like day to day stuff. And then we would go out and film stuff, and I'd get you, I'd watch you getting fucking mobbed <laughs> at like Joondal up Lakeside and stuff. Does that still, I mean, yeah. it must get worse now because yeah. now you're like 1.4, 1. 1.6. 1. 1. Yeah. I had kids, oh, I did a giveaway yesterday at the Cold Creamery. I um, saw it, yeah, because yeah. it made me think of the other one, that the, the one yeah. that we did with the AirPods and stuff. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was, I had over 50 kids show up with their mums. Yeah. And because my tagline is, um, and everyone's like, oh, Rove did something similar, like say hi to your mum for me. Yeah. Mine is share this with your mum. I find that f- a lot funnier. Share this with your mum. Share yeah. this with your mum. Like it could be anything. Yeah. And I want to I want to get a shirt saying share this with your mum. Get Rose's face on it. <laughs> <laughs> it he'd love it. He would. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's like it, it's it's misquoting quoting him but giving him a bit of a uh, yeah. you know. Man, I'd love it's to. A, it's a nod it's a nod to him. Yeah. I try to get um uh the uh, Dave, Dave, on. Yeah. Um, he's <laughs> we tried a book once. He got the date wrong. Poor guy. Wait, who? Sorry, Dave. Dave. Uh, Dave O'Neill. No, Dave no, Callan. Callan. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Sorry. I want to. Can't wait to have him on. He'll be great. He will. Yeah. yeah. He's a very interesting guy. Oh yeah. He's yeah. a ninja. Man, every time I go to the post office, his <laughs> fucking face on the lottery. Thing. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Dave. Let's get you on. I think he has the. They've got his likeness for like another year or so. Yeah, dude, yeah. that's that's goals. Like that, that would be worth a, a, a quite a decent amount. I hope know? so. Yeah. Yeah, I hope so too, because th- those things come and go, and you know, like putting your face on something like that, um, especially yeah, it has a good bit of community um, yeah. behind it. It's it's so good, um, but I I just see brands miss the mark all the time like with pentanet for example the bus thing yeah that was good but they didn't they didn't leverage it on social media at all and it I was, was like, also like we didn't really i talked to you about it at the time but i found it quite amusing to say the least that they had a russian born <laughs> with this military style of it while the war was just kicking off and i was like i hope they don't notice or say anything at all about this because that was funny yeah i yeah. think we filmed it and then yeah like a few days later or something there was something in the news going on and you were uh, you were like oh, i want to reply to this thing i was like don't don't say anything don't draw attention to it just fucking leave it <laughs> oh fuck I remember, I remember a little while, for a little while, I was like, hey, Dave, can I reply to this? No, you can't. You're, you're you can't. My, Just you're leave my it. PR person yeah. for a second. Yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's, it, now I get 
Sabine to do it more, but I'm pretty chill on on my engagement on socials. I just always think like, is it really worth it? It's Sometimes not. it's worth it in the no. moment, and you're like, this is fucking funny. No, you just tell your mate. Like, right. You just te- text your mate. Like, okay, yeah, I, need, ex- I need someone to validate this. Exactly. Stick it in a group chat or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, you, get, yeah. you don't need thousands of people to see it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, oh man, I it's that fuck you money that Dave Chappelle talks about that I mm. really really strive for. So then I can be a little bit more. This is my opinion. <laughs> but uh, at the same time, I, I have these two rules now for my content. Is it interesting and is it valuable? Or at least one or the other. Mm. If it's, uh, I try to go for both. Is it interesting and is it valuable? Valuable as in you get something out of it. You get something that, because that dry, that goes that brings up the saves. Like yeah. if, if more people save it, that means it's valuable to them. They want to come back to it and replay it, mm. and not because it was funny, but because they're like, oh shit. And then that would probably warrant more followers as well, because they're like, oh, well, if he said that in this video, what else is he gonna say? Mm. I'm gonna binge watch, but I'm also gonna follow him because it takes about three to five videos for someone to go, yeah. He's worth a follow. I could I could subscribe to this. <laughs> I mean, you would know way better than I would, but I would argue it's a lot more. Yeah. Because like you don't need to follow anyone anymore. You just don't. Like no. I I can just I can start a brand new TikTok account right now yeah. and I can just watch four of your videos and then I don't need to follow you. I will see your videos every yeah. time I open that fucking yeah. app. So that's the next challenge. Um and again, referring to Mr. Beast, he's nailed it. How do you get the followers locked in? Because it's essentially a like an email list. Yeah. It is in essence and validation and that but uh there's apps coming out now like kind of like social blade where you can see the engagement rate on your thing but it's also the quality mm. of the followers that you have yeah. so there's nowhere to hide anymore you have millions of followers amazing but did you get millions of followers because you had like one video go off exactly. and they don't engage with exactly. you at all because they followed for like one video? And that's why I'm not parading around going, you know, like this and that, that and the other. I still leverage it, but I am real with it. Mm. Like I had two videos that collectively built me a million followers. One was to gain a community with a sense of um, belonging, sense of inclusivity and community building. That was the cat one. <laughs> Shout outs to you there. <laughs> and the other one was fear of missing out. And that was uh, the one uh, last January. I, w- I was in my local shopping center and the kids recognized me. Sev, oh my God. I'm like, do you follow me on TikTok? And like, yeah, prove it. Yeah. That got me 400,000 new followers. Did it? Yeah. And Mr. Beast did that. He walked around uh, Walmart and uh, or his mates walked around Walmart yeah. with briefcases, 10 grand in them. Like, do you follow Mr. Beast? No. Oh, do you follow Mr. Beast? Yes. Prove it. Oh, you're not subscribed. Bad luck. And then they'd find someone they'd be like, oh, great, cool. You've Here's proven it. Here's 10K. Jeez. And I, th- I don't know how many millions of followers he gotten from that video alone, but I took that and I was like, see if it works. It fucking works. Especially like if you're talking about local. Yeah. Like obviously you want oh, people that are... are I think I'm exhausted. Area. I think I've pretty much exhausted local at... Except for as kids get older, yeah. As get, kids get older, they jump on TikTok and stuff. But I mean, can you? I don't know where Mr. Beast lives. I don't know what city he's based in. America. But what city? I mean, <laughs> I have no idea. So but let's just say like he's based in Chicago, for example. Yeah. If you lived in Chicago and mm-hmm. there was a slight chance that you might bump into him and he might say, "Prove it," here's ten grand. You'd probably just follow him anyway. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But the reason why he's also grown his channel is because he's got multiple channels, um, in uh, like bilingual. Yeah, like Spanish. Yeah, I saw the Spanish interview with him where he was huge. talking yeah, about yeah. the thing that he did. Yeah. Um, but nobody's talking about it, or nobody's really trying to go for it here in Australia. Well, I, I think, don't really see it. Yeah, maybe, maybe. I think a lot of it is, you know, he started at a time when it was a bit. I'm not. I'm not saying this is why he's big, but he did. Mm. He started it when early. it was easier to start. Yeah. Whereas now, if you just jump in right now. Mm. Like, which you have to, you have to jump in. But if, when, if you're jumping in right now, it's harder. But you need to be good at maths. Yeah. Pretty much. You need, to, as you said earlier, you need to be good at like the business side of it, the marketing side of it. You can't just do like one thing. No. 
You can't just do like one yeah. part of it and go like, all right, I hope this works because mm. it won't. It's it's how there's too many people that it, 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 it's a lifelong career. It's a it's a business. It's it's legitimate a thing. Everybody wants to be famous for something, mm. and people get famous for fifteen seconds being on fucking Survivor <laughs> or Maths or Lo- Love Island or that Squid Game show, you know. And mm. I see them, and I see them go into it, and they they hold on to it for a while. I'm like, all right, you've got a bit of attention at the moment. What are you going to do with it? Show people what you're made of. Yeah. Not, I was on a TV show, look at me. I'm on a and PR list. Four getting, or five years later, still writing that. I was on season two of so-and-so, <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. And they, and they have these rates, like $150, $300 an hour rates. I'm like... For what? For what? Like, Is it consultation stuff or...? No, 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 for their like, influencer. Oh, okay. Like yeah. UGC shit. Yeah. And I'm like, okay... Let's say we roll with it, 300 bucks, here you go, an hour of your time, and you post it on your channel. Mm. What do we get out of it? What's the return on investment? Eyes on it. And the other thing I noticed as well with PR as well, so these PR companies, they have lists of four or 500 influencers, influential people in their cities, right? And they invite them to a premiere of a movie or they have a new restaurant out, right? What do they all go do? They all come in and the only one request the PR company asks is, can do a story of the night or three stories. Mm. How long does the story last for? 24 hours. 24 hours and then it's gone. So what they do is they grab all that data and go, oh, Sev, can you take a screenshot of how many views you got from that? And then they ask everybody yeah. and then they obviously add them all up and then they put that report and send that to the the whoever the hired them to do that. You mm. know, The injection, the, everyone's talking about it, must be good. But then a few days later... And I've seen this happen time and time again. I go onto Google reviews of that business. Fuck all. And I'm like, where? I know for a fact that my wife, Sabine, she rates, she, she wants to go to places that have a lot of reviews. Yeah. Yes, she does find them on the internet as well, like from content. But that content's not from a story. No. It's from yeah, a, that's a good point. It's from a permanent piece of content from that creator. And like Keith Lee guy from vegas he reviews food places he's got like 12 13 million followers on tiktok mm. they call it the keith lee effect and i love the guy he's he's full-on f- like just just himself yeah um family man and like he was struggling like a, just over a year and a bit ago um making ends meet but he was figuring it out with his family and yeah he struck gold on on there and I love the comment, we made the right person famous. Because mm. anytime he goes to a, a restaurant and reviews them and they give them, and he gives them a good review authentically and he pays for the food, mm. he doesn't ask for freebies, there's like a line out the door for months. He's saved businesses yeah, doing this. That's amazing. And in here, like, it's a bit harder to, to, to grow that. Yeah. But I've had that, I've had that success as well. I went to my local South African um, cafe and they make their beef jerky and i was like mm. this is the fucking best beef jerky i've had in perth i made a tiktok about it the next time i came in they were like sev thank you so much for making that video we have so many people come yeah, well, you in you did it with uh bully butcher and yeah your you barbers know? and you know? all those and, guys and that's authenticity yeah. i'm not getting paid to do that um to review it to go pump it up it's genuinely part of my life do you know what the other thing though and interestingly that you mentioned about the stories disappearing is that the content you made for bully butcher is permanently on your feed exactly. for people to see exactly and and that's where i think pr companies need to pivot they need to go out there and go hey do you reckon you can make a th- permanent 30 second video yeah. of you enjoying something or better still review yeah. like review review the place whilst you're there five star review as long as you obviously like it you know mm. if you don't like it leave it just do a story yeah. you know that would help the business far greater than a 24 hour thing mm. and the pe- people just want people are selfish they just want to get something for nothing yeah. You know, if I go into a, a restaurant for the first time and I genuinely like it, even though they are, this happened to me a few weeks ago. They said, Oh, can you, can you do a story for it? I'm like, Yeah, no worries. Mm. I loved the food. And I was like, I can't just give them a story. I need to do the, do the, the whole TikTok whole promo thing. Yeah. yeah. And it got 100,000 views on nice. TikTok and like 16,000 views on Instagram. Collab- they collaborated with me. I didn't tag the PR company. 
Yeah. They don't deserve shit because they didn't do <laughs> shit. They just had me on a list. Yeah. Like, you know, <laughs> they're going to see this and they're going to go, well, fuck that guy. We don't get any credit. Oh, well, you didn't do anything. Yeah. You just connected me. Mm. Why should I tag you? You know, yeah. and that's what I mean. Why in, in restaurants or groups of restaurants or any business, they need to find the creators that love them for them, for the, for what they they're already using the product or the already going there. Hey, we saw your TikTok the other day. We thank you so much for visiting our restaurant. Thank you so much for reviewing our food. We absolutely love the video. Mm. We would love for you to come back and do it again for us if you would like, and we would love to not only give you free food. As part of it, whatever you want to order, would love to give you m- some money. Yeah. You know, bear in mind this is our budget, you know, like say 300 bucks. But you've also got to rely then, if you're not using an agency, you have to rely on somebody coming into the restaurant and then them knowing that that's it's like somebody who can do that for them. Yeah. Well, that's where the businesses need to learn how to do that. Otherwise, they're going to run out of money trying to use an agency who doesn't give a fuck. Mm. And the creators are also, they, they're vulnerable. Like, I never got management, full-time, proper, exclusive management for me because I know that they're not, they don't really give a fuck, bottom line. Mm. And they take, they, they connect and that's it. Well, I, th- I think they do give a fuck. It just depends on what you are to them. Yeah. Like, yeah. like they've all got rosters with the upper yeah. echelon of, of, you know, creators or actors, yeah. whatever it is. But it's a, it's a hamster wheel. It. It's, it's, it's like it's, it's a re- revolving door as well. Like I see creators that strike it big on TikTok. Yeah. And they, they get millions of views, millions of followers. They get all these deals. They get invited to these red carpet events. And then two, three years later, see you later. Yeah, Why do you think that is? Because they didn't like they didn't learn how to how to as you all say like they didn't pivot they didn't find yeah. the other th- the a way to leverage like what they had at the time into something else yeah which because no one's giving them that advice and that's where I want to come. No of one gave us that advice either. No one gave yeah. me that advice. Like I just. But now we can build a course. Come <laughs> come join Lincoln Bio. <laughs> but that's the thing. If I was to build a course, I'd want it to be free. Yeah, yeah. Like I've done comedy workshops, like writing workshops yeah. for various people now you know and it's they're quite valuable yeah but i think that's where we're going the courses should be free yeah but what they will still hire you for is helping implement it Mm. that's what alex homozi does yeah i don't know i i mean i agree i just there's a big part of me that doesn't want to take anyone's money i don't want to take anyone's money for that side of it yeah well i've i've heard that example before and i've heard people get hate hate emails or hate mails or threats mm. from people who have courses that are getting paid that's their livelihood yeah and then then bringing out free courses but the ones that put out the free courses those people get results like mm. sometimes get results but there is a de- uh, rebuttal to this if it's free what's the likelihood of you actually going through the course yeah there's no you haven't put any value on it right so that's where the money makes sense but that's where your brand comes in if your brand is clutch and you communicate it then but i think this is the this is the main part where i i differ from a someone like you for example is that i don't want to do the educational side of it because i take far more satisfaction from if you came to me personally and said how do i do this yeah like how do i get into tv writing i'll just sit you down and i'll go through everything that i I do that as well exactly i've been doing it with people a lot more recently as well because as the cv sort of like builds a bit it's something that you can you can like you can do it with a bit of authority and be like this is exactly the route that i took these are the people that i went to these are the this is how i did it yeah i would rather do that on a you know to somebody who just comes to me then do it as a you know like a workshop where I've just charged like fucking eight hundred bucks or some shit because that would just make me feel dirty especially yeah. it's transactional yeah what's the um, social media comedy and in person comedy difference to you what's that oh it's enormous the two don't speak to each other at all hardly I'm good I think are we good are we still good coming yeah 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 sorry um, just conscious of time yeah so tell me tell me more like i remember you were were talking about this ages ago where you were like it is a bit of a there's a whole bunch difference of how you portray yourself online and then all of a sudden in person i see a lot of people succeeding on tiktok and then Mm. they're they're going out and doing stand-ups yeah and then they're finding a bit of a a shell shock like yeah i i mean 
I think there, there's some examples of people who got really big on TikTok, like Luke Kidgel, for example, Blake Pavey, people like that. Actually, I'm not sure if Blake was doing stand-up before he was doing TikTok. But anyway, that, those are two examples of people who are incredible comics. Yeah. And they're also really good at making the content. Yeah, he, Blake Pavey's a great writer. Oh, Blake Pavey's... F those videos that he... That, like, he was the first person that I saw do the sort of, like, the, the, the dual character thing. Where yeah. he would just, like, flip from one to the other. Where I was just in fucking bits. Mm. Like, he's so talented. And he's a great comedian, too. Um, so I, I think, like, he... I think that was just in him. You know, the... the stand-up thing is probably just in him whereas i think a lot of people as well do that thing like all right what's next for me how do i leverage this big audience that i've got they'll probably come to shows i don't know i'll i'll, I'll do stand-up and then it falls flat because it's not a thing that they really wanted no, to do or they to be, were really into yeah, they just involved thought in like oh, i want to monetize this thing that i've got going and yeah. ride this train well, what about the other way around comics who have started with stand-up and they need to get onto socials i think that's a lot easier but that's easier said than done because yeah. i went the other way so yeah, I don't know. I mean, I did everything backwards. Most most people start doing stand up and then they try and get into like TV writing and stuff like that. Yeah. I did it the other way around, um, so I can't really speak to it. But I do think that it feels like this, that, that social media side of things should be easier because one, you can be putting out clips of your stand up, and if you're already comfortable on stage, and that shouldn't be too hard. And then you write jokes anyway. This is the thing that I tell people about. You know, where they go like, oh, "Is it worth starting a Twitter or starting a Threads account?" Like, well, probably not necessarily for any other reason than you are just going to be writing jokes daily and then share them everywhere put them everywhere like why not what's the worst that can happen yeah and it's a testing ground as well you exactly. get more engagement on one that really hits you're like cool we should make a video about it and even if we're all like use it on stage or, try, or find mm. a way of like making that into something that you can then use yeah. on stage so with with the social media pivot and going on to that realm and being able to have a, a, a new wave of audience on there, younger audience coming up to become mature enough to, you know, get the fucked up jokes. Hmm. What do you see Gen Z in terms of their sense of humor in the next few years? That's interesting. And the iPad generation. I mean, technically Gen Z is that as yeah. well, the later ones. But yeah. then Gen Alpha, your, your son's Gen Alpha. Yeah. They're all on iPads. They're looking at Roblox and Minecraft and shit like mindless that. Mindless shit as well. Hey? But they're looking at mindless shit as well. So you do wonder how that will translate into, into humor later on. But then you've got to remember that we did that when we were kids. Yeah. We didn't watch that stuff necessarily, but we watched shit like fucking... I mean, Tom and Jerry, where was the humor really in those two? Like, they were just chasing each other, beating the fuck out of one another. But you're smiling because you remember it fondly. Yeah. And that's probably what they'll do. They'll be like, fuck, do you remember when we used to watch some cunt play Minecraft for eight hours? Like, what the fuck were we doing? <laughs> we could have just played that game ourselves. We yeah. had it. Like, we chose yeah. to watch somebody else do it yeah. while they were, I don't know, drinking some drink and talking about their whatever. Um, yeah, it's, I think it's just a, an iteration of what we went through, but just slightly different. And yeah. it's easy for us to be like, eh, they're kind of fucked. But do you feel like they're... You're right, it is very similar, but I feel like they have an abundance more choice which means if they oh, get bored for sure. they don't they don't have the luxury oh, not luxury we didn't have the luxury of going this episode's fucking shit swipe it's oh, i guess i've got to commit to it or change the channel yeah. and there's nothing else on and i'm gonna go have a wank well, <laughs> well this is why you know you look at shows like seinfeld um, you know, arguably one of the most successful, well, not arguably, it is one of the most successful shows of all time. But, like, would it have been as successful if they made that show today? Probably not, because, you know, it, ultimately it was a show about nothing. But let's forget about whether you love it or you hate it. I'm just saying the, the choices that we have now, the, who's going to watch, like, an entire season of, of that now, necessarily? Like, the numbers that it was getting back then is because people had three other fucking options. Whereas now you got to remember, it's not just our phones and the millions of other options that are on like your fucking on your smart TV. There's video games. There's like there's mm. so many other things that you can be doing rather than watching. And I'm guilty of that too. If you look at my continue watching for David Netflix thing, man, the bar is like this on about <laughs> 50 fucking things that I've gone. All right, I'm in the mood for you know watching this, and then I just go, ah, I'm just gonna play some COD or I'm gonna go out and do something. Do you know what I mean? Like have a wank. Have, yeah, yeah. We have so many more options now. Yeah. And uh, I mean, for f that's the consumer side. What does that mean for the producing side? It means uh, that you've got to get them so quickly. Yeah. And what that's the case with everything. Like stand up, your, your, your opener has to be 
Like you need to get them as soon as you can, get them laughing as soon as you can. Mm. Every video that you put you out. need to hook them in. Yeah. You need to hook them in and get them invested. What do you think the two to three key things to achieve that is, whether it's stand up or online? To, to hook in them really quickly? To hook in them really quickly, but also get them invested for however long you need them to. Retaining, retention. Yeah. I mean, it, it's definitely uh, it's definitely different like for stage and it's different for different people. So for example, I don't have my own audience when I'm on stage. I'm part of like lineups and galas and stuff. Nobody comes to see me yet. That'll come, but they're not doing it yet. Whereas uh, even somebody, you know, like Andrew Wolf, for example, there are people that go to his solo show just for him. So he has this like luxury essentially where he doesn't need to be funny immediately because they're there for him and they know that he's funny most people have seen him before most people have never seen me before so i have to make them laugh really quickly and then i have to keep getting them and i can't just tell dave Chappelle style fucking monologues expecting them to pay attention to me and be yeah. like super invested so i think it's knowing your audience as well yeah knowing your audience is huge yeah and i i see off off the topic of co uh, co comedy for now like hospitality is an interesting one to crack, but it, the secrets in the reviews. Do you mean content for hospitality? Yeah. So yeah. content uh, for hospitality starts with the audience and how they talk, and which audience you want to come into your restaurant. Mm. And the secret is the real secret is looking at the reviews. You look at the last six months of your reviews, the positive ones. And just grab the keywords, the most common keywords mm. out of what they're saying and you plant those keywords into your content. That's interesting. Because you're talking like they are. Yeah. And if you don't have any reviews, you're going to just take the reviews from your Someone competitors. Someone else, yeah. Exactly. And I think this is the next thing. This is the next big you thing. You may have just given away a big secret. <laughs> oh, no, I... <laughs> I think it's going to happen really quickly, yeah. but oh, I like okay. to I like to say it early, yeah. put it on, yeah. and just be historically correct. Yeah, because with AI, we haven't we haven't gone to this topic yet, but uh, might be a time for another uh, another time we can talk about it. But AI is using this internet in a way that we've never seen before, mm. scraping data, but also collect collecting it in one group and then ranking everyone in a way we've never seen before. Yeah. So I reckon the most successful hospitality industry businesses will be the ones that understand how to bring more reviews in to then grab that data in the keywords to put on not only just their website, but also in the content they produce to bring more people in. And then it becomes a full circle and cycle. Whereas instead right now, all they're doing is going, right, we need a decent website with some SEO, Mm. copywriting cool who cares and it, it it helps but only for one specific generation the older the generation older generation gen yeah. z doesn't even know how to use google yeah i, I mean well because we we don't need to anymore we just type it in our search bar so like then the next is. problem is okay how do we get gen z oh they're on tiktok right sev can you help us on tiktok no worries they do the tiktok they get some people in from gen z but then they're like oh fuck how do we get more reviews ask them how do we do that you give them an incentive. Mm. Okay, they do that. But then they don't do anything with it. And then now with AI, I reckon everyone's going to be running to figure out how to get that golden tri uh, tri trilogy, the, the, the God triangle yeah. of reviews, putting into web, like design, the web website, and also the content. Mm. And then it, and it just... I reckon it'll be exponential growth from there because like, well, I went to Italy 2022 and there was a restaurant in Florence and it had this focaccia sort of bread there and it was the most popular one. It had a line, a half an hour line. It was so popular that it had the same exact setup across the road. So when I got there, that line actually was two lines towards the end uh, towards the the restaurant bit because mm. it would split into either right, side yeah and i looked online thirty five thousand five star reviews for this bread <laughs> and oh dude it was amazing yeah. it was amazing like placebo aside but it was amazing they had it sussed good volume italian italians just yeah. know how to cook and 
what I looked at that was there is no one near that 35,000 rating. There was a couple close in the, in the tens of thousands, but no one near it. Mm. And I'm thinking, what if one place in Perth cracked that and had, fuck, 5,000, 10,000 five-star reviews? Everyone, it would be sold out for years, yeah. right? So that's, that's where I'm going with the AI thing. And, and, and I'm not looking to replace creatives, writers, because I'm not worried about knowing it. you. I'm, I know you're not worried about it, but I hear a lot of others worried about it. I got but attacked the by thing some. Is, sorry, go ahead. I got attacked by some um, some uh, person who's a writer. Mm. Um, this was like about four months ago online. Yeah. And this person was like, and this was during the writer strike too. So they were like, "How dare you promote this? How dare you build something like this?" And and promoting it during a writer strike. I'm like, this helps writers. Yeah. This this. You, you have creator's block or writer's block. This tool, SS Live, is designed to unblock the creative block. Yeah. It's not meant – you're not meant to copy it word for word because it's inauthentic. I'm getting tagged by all these AI apps now um, that you can literally generate someone in front of you and it looks really authentic of them talking about um, whatever it is you're trying to sell. Mm. People. But it sounds like shit. Yeah, it sounds yeah, like shit. And if and if the internet is flooded with that, yeah. And look, as you say, it's a tool. So the best thing that you could do is to take that and then use that as like the blueprint. And humanize and, it. Yeah, exactly. Humanize it. My here's the thing: like, I'm not worried about losing work to AI because there's many other reasons why I can lose work. I can lose work for you know budget reasons, whatever it is. Someone's better than me. It doesn't matter what it is. This is just another reason. I'm not bothered about it from that sense. The thing that I'm most concerned with is outsourcing my thought process to anything else because the process is really important to me yeah from start to finish and again we've worked together you've seen how i do that as well whether it's on the spot and we're out doing something or whether it's like writing packages whatever mm. like that whole process start to finish is really important to me and i don't just mean from like an ethical point of view that's part of it but i don't want to lose that cognitive fucking speed and function mm. that i have what if it was <laughs> optimized yeah, no, I, 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 I do understand the argument for it as well. This is the thing. And I have friends who use it and, and argue that, you know, it's a tool. It's just like spell check, essentially. Mm. I, 100%. I'm, I get it. And I'm not, I don't shit on anyone who uses it. Yeah. Go ahead to your heart's content. I just, I don't want to rely on anything. I'm up to speed with it. Like, mm. I play with it because yeah. I want to be yeah. able to use it should I need to. Yeah. But at no point, if you hire me to do anything, has AI played a single role mm. And maybe it is a bit of an ethical thing as well, actually, because there is part of me that takes an immense amount of pride knowing that I created something from scratch with my own ideas and experiences and I didn't use anything else. But that whole process of me, you know, with a, whether it's a pen and paper or my phone or yeah. my laptop, doing that by myself, that's yeah. really important to me. Yeah. No, I, and I don't want to lose it. And I think if I did, it's much mm. like to use the spell check analogy, like I reckon that right now most people doesn't matter who, like anyone in this room, the three of us, if we were to handwrite the last 20 text messages that we sent, there would be so many grammatical errors in yeah. there, spelling mistakes, because we don't, we rely now on autocorrect. Very we true. don't really have to think about it. Does the I go here? Does the E go here? It doesn't matter. Once mm -hmm. I've half typed it, the word's finished for me. Yeah. So we've lost that. And I think you will lose the brainstorming part of creating things if you go, right, there's a tool that will do that for me now. Mm. Yeah, and that and that's... And that could be considered de-evolution? I guess. I just, I don't, like I said, I don't want to lose it. Like how much, how much do human beings rely on a lot of things? Like there's smart everything now. Yeah. I watched a movie the other day where they went into a smart home. The smart home just fucked them all up. So if I've lived in this country for nearly 10 years, yeah. I, can't, I couldn't get here without my phone. Yeah. Or a plane. Yeah, no whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't navigate anything yeah. pretty much in this in this city unless yeah. I've been there. Somewhere like the comedy lounge, like to my house, I can get there. Yeah. Right. I can get to the other comedy clubs and stuff that I go to frequently. Yeah. But anywhere else, I'm fucked. All right. So we've got time for a uh, the red mic segment. I really want to segment segment my show and have a, a few different little yeah. things that pop up. So. Grab the red mic, and you can talk into that. You don't have to talk into this one. We'll yeah. figure it out. So I you can, oh, have it close by just in case I can't be fucked editing later. There we go. Okay. 
up and coming comics, aspiring comics, what is your pro tip for them in the writing world? Okay, well in the writing world, it's just to constantly fucking write. It's just to, it's just to keep writing and not lose faith in jokes that don't work because you tried them once or twice, which I've been guilty of. I've written a joke and gone, I find this, I think this is funny. Then I've gone on stage and it hasn't worked. And I've gone, well, that was embarrassing. I'm not doing that again. I've obviously got that wrong. But it's to stick with it until, it, until you definitely know it doesn't work or until you make it work. I love it. Overcoming bombing on stage. Hmm. The fear of bombing on stage. I, I don't think you can overcome the fear of it, but it is made easier by being around people such as Andrew Wolf, who we've mentioned earlier, because he will make it funny. He'll make you bombing entertaining for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and um, your one pro tip in the business of writing. My one pro tip is to consider your social media as a digital resume and to treat it like that. So everything that you put out, you are using as leverage to get your next job. Nice. Okay. Um, and now the next segment, I've got pod decks. I say that specifically. Uh, like that because you might be thinking I'm saying pod dicks, um, but there's different there's different categories. Okay. Right. So um, I'm just going to scroll slowly, and and you just tell me when you see one. And what we're going to do is you're going to give me wrong answers only. Okay. So funny. So, but wait, so, what am I doing? Am I so just pick a category that you like yeah. that you see oh, okay. that you think could be funny. Yeah, techie. Techie. All right. So for the next. Three or four minutes, I'm going to ask you questions. Right. Wrong answers only. Oh, I'm just going to move that there. All right. How often do you get a new phone? Uh, once every day because I don't have a screen cover. Nice. What could never be replaced by technology? And why not? Uh, women, Sev, because women are the best things ever. They're amazing. And sex dolls and AI sex dolls are not going to be any better than women <laughs> Do you think there's value in living a simpler life with less technology? No. No, the PlayStation 5 is incredible. Are you out of your mind? No. Okay. How do you think technological advances can help us solve global warming? Ah, that's interesting. Um, and I don't think global warming can be sorted at all, and I think we're all fucked. That's why you just have to enjoy your PlayStation 5 and your phones and all the rest of it and traveling in private jets. If Greta of Thunberg was right in front of you, what would you say to her? Is it Thunberg or Tunberg? Have you ever had to learn a new technology for work to not become obsolete? Um, yeah, recently I had to learn how to use like a big red mic as well as like a regular mic. Nice. How smart is your home? My home is as stupid as I am. <laughs> Mac or PC? Unfortunately, Mac. I, I'm told PCs are better, but I don't... <laughs> Yeah. Um, all right, a couple more. Were you ever at the forefront of a tech trend that people made fun of you for until it became super popular? The mini disc player, although I was wrong about that, so that doesn't count. <laughs> okay, F final question, and y you feel free to give me an extended answer. What's your favorite movie about technology? <laughs> um, have you seen Space Camp? <laughs> Thank you. My favourite movie about space... Because they had that little Johnny Five thing that wasn't Johnny Five. Max, I think his name was. This is a movie from, like, the 80s because I am old as fuck. Um, and they accidentally launched these kids into space because they, like, punched in the wrong code or something. It's fucking ridiculous. But I always wanted... It's like, the two things I wanted to do when I was a kid, I wanted to be an astronaut or a deep-sea diver. And astronaut was because of that. And uh, quick story about the deep-sea diving, Sev, this is true. Uh, I trained for about 16 minutes on being a deep sea diver by, you know how they always drop backwards off the boat? I did that off the back of the couch and cracked my head open. So I decided that I'll try and be an astronaut instead. Nice, thank you. Thank you for the red mic. And um, one more segment. This is a new one. We've gone from the red mic to the red phone. It's ringing, I'm gonna add sound effects. Pick it up. Hello. It's Bill Clinton. Bill, what's going on? What's that noise? Bill? Hey, yeah, all right, we'll finish that then. Ask 
think, I ask, think he's got someone there with him. Ask him about Epstein. Yeah, mate, what's what's going on with that island? <laughs> nah, because you you were there, weren't you? <laughs> nah, you and the missus. We saw what was that pizza thing about as well? What's going on there? Bill? Oh, he's gone. <laughs> ah, yeah, that's good, that's good. <coughs> All right. Fringe show. How do we get to uh, laugh at you? <laughs> um so yeah, we got Desperate House Guys, which you can find on the Fringe website, and I'm doing another one called Unstable Comedy, and then on a bunch of other like galas and stuff. But Desperate House Guys will be fine. There were two of my favourite comics, Tarbo and Tori, and then my other two favourites, only because I'm doing shows with them all, uh, Buddha or Brian Shields from the Grin Reapers, yep. um, and Chris Pacillo. Uh, so they're on multiple like venues and stuff around yep. the city. So. Fringe World Perth and over east maybe probably. Yeah, uh, in late February, early March. Perfect, perfect. Thanks, Guys, Sev. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for having me. It's a beautiful setup, by the way. You're welcome. I for wish you'd invited me sooner. I did. <laughs> for times. everybody else at home, um, <laughs> if you enjoy the episode, then feel free to leave a review on Spotify or iTunes or wherever the fuck it is. I don't even know. And then if you're watching on YouTube, leave a comment, subscribe if you haven't, like, all that shit. You know what I mean. Please follow on Instagram, Dave Hughes, Dave 8 Hughes. Uh, David A. Hughes. David A. Hughes. It's in the bio. Um, follow him. He's got a lot of followers anyway, but you can be another one. And yeah, go see his Fringe show. Um, he's paying me money to say that. Thank you very much. Love you. Bye. Good thanks.